Video applause for you, Lucy. Nice to join us here tonight. Um, good. I'm going to hand this over to you. And um, the, I usually start by questions about a little bit about your background. This is particularly interesting, I think, for every creative and every photographer, because ultimately what people want to know, what is going on in your mind? How do you uh, got to the point to produce those really fantastic photographs yeah so tell us a little bit about your background if you don't yeah. mind just want to say thank you for inviting me to join you all here tonight mm. um so yeah so a little bit about, i'm um, based in lewisham in southeast london um i didn't study photography um so i'm completely self-taught um i actually um once i left school i did um, biology psychology and french so not creative at all um but I developed an eating disorder once I, when I started that. And so I lost interest in everything and became a bit of a lost soul for a few years um, and got better. And I spent, um, I got a job in a tour operator and airline where I was um, producing brochures and content for the website. Um, and I stayed there for 20 years um, doing that. And um, yeah, so, I was yeah doing that for 20 years. I already downloaded Instagram, um, but it was in the May, May in May 2015 that I saw um, an Insta meet being um, advertised on a, a website, and I thought this sounds cool. Um, I went along to it, really shy. I was with a friend. I didn't want to go alone, and that's where I started um, started getting interested in photography because there was all these people around me who we all just had this common interest in taking photos and going out with our phones and I had a camera it was a Nikon but it was clunky and heavy and I actually I didn't know how to use it um so I just got interested and immersed and it just opened up my eyes to this um a bigger world out there of just taking photos and sharing them um and and it was something for me it was something that i loved doing mm. it was in may in in 2015 as well it was the same year that i invested in an, in my first sony a7r um and that was purely because i was seeing other people taking these photos and um i just wanted to learn more about shooting with a camera and not my iphone and learning how to use a camera because i wasn't using this nikon that i had um and I was just gaining confidence, like going to this meet and meeting other people. Just it was just it was a huge confidence thing for me because I was really shy. Um, and then I decided to go on my first solo trip, um, which was a huge thing for me because again I wasn't used to doing things on my own and I was shy. Um, and the freedom that going away on my own just gave me was, um, it was liberating just to do something on my own, um, go out and take photos all day without anybody else around me. Um, mm -hmm. I came back from that trip and then straight away booked another one. And it was good because I worked in the travel industry. So I was using this cheaper, this cheaper holiday that I could get. Um, went on the second trip and then came back and then went on a third trip to Madeira and that's where I fell in love with taking street photography because uh, I was there for a week and there wasn't anything else around to take photos of that I wanted to take um, and the characters of people there were just incredible and I just fell in love with um, capturing I just wanted to capture what they were doing the character in their face um, I spent a lot of time at Funchal Market um, just taking pictures of people um, and it was just mine. It was something that I just loved doing. Um, and I want, I came back to London and decided that I wanted to put into practice what I'd been doing in Madeira back in London. So I devoted a lot of time, most weekends and any free time that, um, I had from work, I was going out, taking photos, just observing what was going on around me. Um, the way people interact with each other, um, looking out for these little moments that were happening that I'd probably normally just overlook and I wouldn't see before. Um, and I think um, my work grew um, in confidence as I grew in confidence as a person. And I just started to do, just develop this style. Um, and I just started just looking out for those little flickers that just caught my eye in just this overwhelming way that I pressed the shutter. 
Um, and it's those decisive moments that I think um, make a story. And I realized that I could tell stories by taking these photos. Um, and mm. just of people you, going around. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting you're mentioning this, um, Lucy, because um, the, a lot of students that started our school feel the because students you know can have very different very diverse background a lot of students enter the course for example uh, with a big question am i creative enough yeah and i personally don't really think that there's something like creative or uncreative people basically or um or someone is gifted or ungifted yeah it's all about you know it's all, all about the journey and how you can actually explore this i think yeah? so it's really interesting to see i mean that um, what your background actually is and you know how you really how you um, got into taking those absolutely stunning photographs i should just mention at this point everyone um, if you would like to ask some questions there is a q a box um, i'm more than happy to pass on those questions to lucy um, in that moment if i feel uh, that it actually suits the topic otherwise I can accumulate a few of those questions and then ask them towards the end. So we're going to have like a proper Q&A later on. So whenever you feel like asking a question, uh, you can absolutely, you can say this. We've got the first one, Gwen asked already. Um, I'm so interested in Lucy's editing process. I'm sure she's going to talk us through this later on. Yeah, um, We had a really quick chat before we went live. And of course, I asked her, like, how do you do it? So I'm also really excited really to hear. Yeah, Good. So if you don't mind, Gwen, uh, I'm going to, we're going to discuss this later, I'm sure. Super. Fantastic. Sorry, didn't want to interrupt you, Lucy. Go on, please. Okay. And I just, I think, I think every one of us has a story um, in us. I think it's just a, a good picture goes to telling a part of that story and I think that's what I wanted to do with my work um, and I just yeah look just I was loving what I was doing just the freedom to go out with my camera which is like my best friend and I, I never feel lonely when I have my camera anyway so um it, actually in the October of that um of 2017 um the airline that I worked for collapsed so I'd been there 20 years um and so all these emotions came with that and um, it's because it's where I grew up, essentially. Um, and I, I just knew that I didn't want to go into another office job um, thinking, what if, what if. Um, so I took it as a, a now or never time to just pursue photography and to do something just for myself. And it's the same time, um, the same year that I was approached by a publishing company um, to appear in a London city book. Um, with another bunch of London photographers. Um, so Trope Publishing approached me, um, wanted me to appear in the London book, but then they liked what I was doing and they liked the work that I was sharing on my Instagram feed, um, which was taking photos and adding a story and also adding some words to go with the image, um, almost creating this sort of fictional um, story by words and images. Um, and that's where I published my book with them um, called Unfinished Stories. So I think now is a good time for me to share my screen, if that's okay. Absolutely. Bear with me. Um, so yes, yeah, so Unfinished Stories, that's the front cover. Um, by the way, I'm just, I wrote some notes, so I'm just going to look down at some of my notes a couple of times because there's a few um, things that I want to point out. Um, so yeah, so the front cover of my book, Unfinished Stories, and Unfinished Stories is a collection of my street moments and memories that I've captured going around um, the London and on my travels. And it's just of moments that um, I've seen of people going about their daily lives. Um, and it's called Unfinished Stories because I think of all my images as unfinished because I don't know the story of the person that I'm taking a photo of. I don't know what they're going through and what they're thinking or feeling. It's just my interpretation um, using my imagination and I'm coming up with a story that I think they're feeling or thinking and um, putting them together and um, Yes, they're just there. They're unfinished stories. 
Um, and the work in this book is um, over a, a course of about four years. Um, and in the book, I also I've um, shared the images so I can buy because I love writing. So I've added words to go with the images. And again, I, with this, I just want the viewer to look at the image. Maybe they'll read the writing that I've written to go with it. And I want them to interpret their own version of what they're seeing. And they might agree with what I've written or they might disagree. And I think that's the beauty of photography and storytelling is that it'll either engage, it'll, it'll, it'll evoke a feeling or a thought um, and you'll come up with your own um, version of what you think is going on in that image and um, spark a feeling. Because I, and I also think that um, each one of us will use our own past experiences to um, first take that image and change it into our emotions and then put it into words. Um, so that's my dad holding my book on the right hand side. Um, and it was really special seeing him hold my book because his eyesight is slowly going. So to have him hold my book um, of my work and my words and see him reading it was really special. Um, for the next few slides, actually, I'm going to show some of my favourite images that I like taking. And these are reflection stories or through the looking glass. Um, I just love taking these. I'm fascinated by peering into coffee shops um, and seeing what's going on behind the window. But I'm also fascinated by what's going on outside the window and the reflection that's passing by. Um, I always like to think of these as like a three way story because there's me, the photographer and often two strangers. And in that split second of me pressing the shutter, we're all connected. Um, and I just, I, I love taking these and I, I just think there's so many stories that I'm, um, I've seen behind these windows and going past and I've been called a spy and all sorts of things, but I'm just in my own little world when I'm taking these photos. And I think as well with these, you just get the, la there's layers which are all adding to the storytelling style of my photography. Um, this lady, actually, I took her just before we went into lockdown um, in back in March. So this is one of the last photos I took back in early March. And I just saw her sitting there and she just looked so fragile. And I'm going to read out some of the words that I put with these to see if the viewer, see if you guys agree or disagree, or you're going to come up with your own interpretation of what you're seeing. Um, and I wrote the words more fragile than we realized because she just looked so sad and we were all entering this unknown and I felt like she was also feeling that. Again, I just love, love looking into these cafes. And I wrote the words, despite efforts to erase you from my mind, I still find myself wondering how your day is going who you talk to and whatever drama it is you have now. And I just love her look and then the reflection of the guy walking past. Mm. These are so beautifully um, ambiguous. Mm -hmm. So I think one quality that, that photography has is its ambiguity. So that's the, it's so, it's ultimately the, um, trying to explain a larger context in a fraction of a second ultimately really leads to, you know, ultimately leads to, 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 to making those images open to interpretation so everybody can actually see something different in there. Yeah. yeah. Really beautiful the way you underline this with your own words. Yeah. Um, I've got some, we've got some more chats. So the, uh, just to quickly keep you updated, we've got um, more questions about how this is done. Yes, yeah? so I'm sure we're gonna talk about this later on. So Paul asks if these are double exposures in the camera or if these are taken with a single shot, yeah. Um, the, I must say really like uh, Lucy, you know, if you 
you know, you, you don't even have to reveal this at one point, you know, if you don't, you know, would like to keep this a secret, mm -hmm. but obviously like all of us want to know how those images are actually done, yeah? Yeah, it's just one shot taken through the camera. I wouldn't know how to layer them up in the Photoshop. <laughs> I'm not that technical. <laughs> so no, it's just, it's just one photo. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all about just, um, it's about the right light outside of the window not having having something too busy on the opposite side of the road um and it's about lining up the reflection of somebody going past just so that they're illuminating the person behind the window um, and you don't have to do it in cafes you can do it at home i've done it with my dad <laughs> outside at, outside our at our front window um it's just about the right light if it's too sunny it doesn't work mm. I can imagine, and you probably also need to have something dark as a background. So yeah. I, I assume that this face, for example, would not stand out so much, let's say, like in front of a white wall. Mm -hmm. But if you get the timing and the perspective right, then probably pure magic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, it happens. Yeah. We've got Eunice asking, um, do you have a chat with with the person that you photograph? I don't. No, I like to. I think um, I, unless unless they engage in conversation with me, but I never, not usually. I think it just breaks the magic. It breaks that moment. Um, you know what it's like when you're asking someone to pose, or you you start talking to them, their body language just changes completely, and that moment's just gone. Um, so I very rarely talk to them. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That kind of links to a question uh, by Philip. He asks um, your feelings and processes about how your work really um, uh, about how you work really resonates with my experience. The connection fact is something that I'm really interested in and want to explore more in my work. Would you like to talk about it more? Um, yeah. Um, so the connection is it's just about how you're feeling. I I always think that. Um, even unconsciously, it's, it's impossible for you to separate what you're feeling when you're taking a photo um, and what you're capturing. So that connection with the person, it's just, I, I don't know, I think it's just how you're feeling and just observing a lot um, just to see what the person either behind the window or out in the street is doing. Mm. Um, and kind of like just zoning in just to try and capture that decisive moment of when they're looking up or when they're looking at somebody. Mm, I see. The uh, Gwen asks, um, do you ever find that people in the shop catch your eye and wonder what you're up to? Yes. <laughs> I've had it a few times, but I also, I'm really mindful. I don't want to upset anyone. Um, and I don't go and stand straight in front of them. So I always try to stand on their peripheral edge of their peripheral vision. So not to intrude too much. I mean, I have had a couple of them just look at me, but they never come out. Um, <laughs> I've had someone walk past before wondering what I'm doing and she got really angry, but um, I just told her I was a photographer and she just walked off. So, <laughs> um, but never inside really. Yeah, that that brings me also to another question by Sarah. Uh, do you feel fear when taking uh, taking photos of strangers? How do you overcome this? Um, I do. I used to feel fear. I think again, it comes with confidence, and it also comes with just observing your surroundings. I always London's quite easy. I I kind of I've been to like most areas in London that I I never go in and shoot straight away. I think you have to weigh up your surroundings. Um, I mean, talking from experience, Lewisham for me, I feel fear in Lewisham because it's home. Um, so I'm really careful about shooting in Lewisham. Whereas if I go into London, it's busy. There's lots of tourists around. Everyone's on the go. And I, when I don't know them, say, it's a lot easier. Whereas Lewisham, I feel it's just so close. Um, and so I do feel fear sometimes. But I think with practice and just gaining confidence, I mean, you'll see, I'm going to show in a, a few other slides how um, I'll show you the photos that I, some of the photos I took in Madeira and you'll see the difference. I was a lot further away and it's just about that confidence in like gradually getting closer 
um, to your subject and working out what you want to tell when you're taking a photo and the story you want to tell. Mm. Um, just to let you know, I've got more, more questions coming in now, but I'm going to give you some time just to talk a little bit more about your work. Uh, everyone else, the particular like uh, Gillian, um, I have um, I've seen, seen your question and I'm going to maybe bundle them a little bit later uh, or, you know, I'm going to bundle a few more questions a little bit later then pass them, gonna, uh, pass them on to you, Lucy, if you okay. don't. Okay. Okay. Again, another reflection. I just love the way she was looking at something and he's looking back and that just, the, it felt like the connection, even though there wasn't between the two subjects. Again, the first image for me, there's just two lots of emotion going on and it feels quite intense. And I just, I just love wondering what's going on behind that window. I'm gonna read the words to this one. Um, you're swimming in thoughts. I could have stayed here a little longer to watch you. You look so perfect, sad and tired, but perfect. This is one of my favorites. Um, I was feeling quite emotional this day, the day I took this photo. I'd been having some friend drama and I was standing at this window and I looked in and I just saw this woman and she looked really sad. Um, and again, it goes back to just, I think it's impossible to separate what I'm feeling from when I'm creating something. Um, and I think there's a bit of me in every single photo that I'm taking. I'm gonna read the words to this one. Do you remember when we watched the sunset? You hugged me so tight like you would never let me go. And now it's just a memory. And I just thought she looked sad. She was remembering something or a memory or I don't know, but she just looked so sad. And it was kind of reflecting how I was feeling. I, when I'm editing, I always, I always shoot in color but I always, I, there's something about a black and white photo that I just love, um, unless the color speaks to me. Um, so I added a couple of color reflection shots in there as well. Okay, so these are the ones I took in Madeira. Um, and I think you can tell a difference in the style. These were shot on a 35 millimeter lens and um, it was when I wasn't as confident, um, but you can see the character is what I fell in love with in the people. And that's where my street photography kind of it, passion started. Um, and I remember taking this little girl on the left and feeling so giddy excited that I'd taken this shot and caught a moment. But I think I would have probably got a lot closer nowadays. Again, you'll see it's very different to how I'm taking photos now. These next photos are all taken on the street. So again, it's just the layering um, of capturing somebody in between people and having that layer. It just, I think it just transforms a flat image into something more magical and tells more of a story. And I just love the way that the light was shining on the little girl's face. And she's looking at me as if to say, what are you doing? Um, and the light's just illuminating and, and there's stories going on around her. You, so, so I have to say this, Lucy, have mm. you ever been, have you ever taken street photographs in, in uh, New York, in Manhattan? I have. I didn't like New York <laughs> to shoot in. <laughs> yeah. in the, um, at, at a certain time of the day, you've got the, you know, you've, you've got all those uh, streets and avenues, right? Yeah. And so the, the light basically like, uh, basically like shines through those streets or avenues, I always forget this. And yeah. you've got this super high contrast. Um, and it's almost like as if the sun basically like puts or sets like spotlights on different people. Uh huh wait at specific spots and because you know you've got this light spot right in front of you yeah you wait until someone actually passes yeah. through yeah well that part that's on regent street and the light always hits this spot amazing like you're mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. so i i have stood here uh, quite a few times just waiting for that right person i think um some street photographers will say that they keep walking they'll walk and walk and walk um 
but I actually I quite like to stand and find a spot and just watch what's going on around me um, almost anticipating something to happen because um, I know that I've walked around all day and I've never t I've taken 15 photos and I've not been happy with them whereas if I stand somewhere and it's a busy crowd and then you just capture someone looking back at you like in this shot um, that means everything more than the 15 photos that you might have taken mm. and I just love how she's just looking straight through the crowd at me yeah, and would you would you stay in one spot, for example, like for half an hour, or would you constantly be on the move? Um, I tend to stay in one spot. I used to move around a lot, but I tend to stay in one or two spots now because I know that there's they're quite busy, and I just like what's going on. Um, like for for this one, this was at Oxford Circus. Um, again, when when it was busy. Um, and you just ca can capture it. it almost you're framing somebody in between the people um, and if I'm moving around um, I find that I'm not getting as many good quality photos I might be getting more in number um, but not the quality and the storytelling that I want to tell with my work hmm. I've got a question from um, Gillian the, uh, that's been sitting there for a while so I want to pass it on to you he asks, um, how do you stop your own reflection being in the photograph? Again, that's standing, so not standing directly straight on at the person who's behind the window, but just staying sort of to the edge and looking in. So they, so you're almost, you're just on the edge of their peripheral vision, sort of to the edge and not straight on at them. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a question of the angle, I guess. Yes, no? mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. So, hi, Jenny. <laughs> Jenny also left a, uh, a message here. So nice. The, the, we're, we're just really, really close friends. Want to quickly say hi. Then Philip asks, um, when you say that there's a little, little bit of you in the photographs, I think what you're feeling attracts the pictures you take. This is the connection that I was uh, talking about okay. earlier. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Philip asks, um, can you talk about your preferred focusing technique? probably he's probably talking about um you know sometimes cameras struggle with reflection so are you supposed to is the camera supposed to focus on something that is being reflected or that is behind the window pane yeah and also like in a in a in a in a crowd like this one here um where obviously you know if you don't focus really precisely you know like the autofocus points if you use multiple they could just pick up on anything Mm -hmm. that's probably what he's interested in like uh -huh. so with the windows i would focus on the person behind the window um more so focusing on their face or their eyes um and i i usually do center focus um so here i'd be sent focusing in the center and uh, just hoping for a gap and a person to look back at me <laughs> so yeah. a lot of the it's quite lucky. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's all autofocus, no, no manual focus. No, but... Yeah, all auto, all, auto, auto focus. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Good. No more questions uh, at this point, but uh, keep it coming, everyone. So I'm going to hand back to you now. Lisa. Okay. Again, I just love like distraction in the photos whether that's an umbrella to create a frame or looking for a shiny surface, or again, that window, or even a coffee cup. If you had a, I sometimes have a coffee cup um, just placed on a, on, a, on a wall and then just having just a bit of a distraction going on. Cause it just, I think it just transforms a flatter image into something more interesting. Again, um, on the underground in London in a busy carriage and just finding this perfect little frame for this woman's face. And I just love how the light is illuminating her. Again, it's through people under arms and people's bodies. Again, they're, they're hard because you have to look for the gaps and then hope that there's someone there. Again, little moments just presenting themselves just to I'm curious about them. Um, I mean, the little boy on the left has got such a cheeky face and in the right one, I feel like I've um, stumbled upon this boy who's been stealing cookies 
and he's not meant to be eating cookies and he's just like wondering who's looking at him. Again, I wasn't even consciously like looking for this shot. I was on my way home and I just saw him in front of me. And again, just the distraction of the guy sitting on his phone um, just leads you straight into the little boy's face. Again, on the underground. And I, what I love here is the woman in the background who's looking straight at me. But then the boy, I'm just so curious about what he's looking up at as the doors are closing. Can I ask you a little bit about, about post-production? Because um, I can see the, uh, the way that the, um, that the faces of the subjects seem to emerge um seem to emerge like from the dark is really really stunning i think do you use a lot of dodging and burning techniques none um i don't over edit any of my images i mean i turn them into black and white increase the highlights maybe brighten them i i i, I edit in photoshop i don't use lightroom but that's purely purely just choice because I was using Photoshop in my previous job um, when I was in the office. Um, and I did a course on Photoshop, but I'm not great at it, honestly. Um, so I would just increase the highlights, maybe add a little bit of contrast. Um, very, and then just play around with the blacks and the whites and, and the color, but in black and white. Um, just working out what, to me, feels good. Mm. I've got another question by uh, Philip. He asks um, if you uh, crop your images or if you if they are like this straight out of the camera. This one straight out of the camera. I some of them I crop. Um, it just depends again whether if there's lots of some lots of busyness going on that I want to just kind of cut away at. I'll crop them. Um, it just, it, it all depends on the image and how I'm feeling. I mean, this one straight out of the camera. Um, this one was taken in Morocco, where again, it was a crazy shoot. It was totally different to shooting anywhere else. Um, people didn't want you to take their photos. So um, for me, it was very weird because um, I'm used to just going ahead and just doing my thing. Um, and I had to be very mindful of shooting in Morocco. But here I just loved and again, looking out for details. I mean, this man's face has got so much detail in it. And again, with his hat, it's just like the little fray in it. And in my, in, in my book, Unfinished Stories, he features in color, but I now prefer him in black and white. Mm -hmm. Again, this, this photo makes me happy. And I remember being happy when I took it. And I think, again, with photography, I just, I just love all the memories and moments that come back with when you're looking back at a photo. I mean, I'm looking at this now thinking, wow, <laughs> because of how many people there are. <laughs> but, um, and I said, I didn't ask people to take their photo, but I did with this guy because Morocco was so different to shooting. Um, people were really on edge. Um, and I was with two friends and we worked out that if we said hello to everybody, they were better at responding to us taking photos. So this guy looked really sad and I just said hello to him and he looked up and I said, can I take your photo? And he was quite happy to. Why do you think that is the, is that a, a cultural um, difference in terms of how photography is recognized? I think so. I think a lot of it was just the cultural difference, but they also wanted money. <laughs> um, they, they were saying Nat Geo, Nat Geo. So they obviously thought we were going to make money from their portraits when we got back home. Um, but the only people that were getting money were them. <laughs> um, so I think it was a mixture of both. Um, it was just, I've never had that experience in any other city before. I've added this one in because the colors are just, they all complement each other. And I don't think if I was actually setting this up and directing the cat to do what it was doing, I don't think I'd ever get the colors so perfect. Um, just the blue in the kitten's eyes with the blue behind and then the red and then the fish guts. 
Um, I just, yeah, it's like I set it up. Um, these were taken in India. And again, I love black and white, but in India, I felt like the color has to happen. These were taken in Italy. Um, and again, with the one with the shot on the left, I wasn't even consciously taking um, the photo. I wasn't ready. Um, I was just, you know, just walking along and this woman just looked straight back at me. Um, it's like she knew that I wanted a shot. Um, and I like to think that that's her husband walking off in the distance. Um, and I, I'm going to read the words that I wrote to this one. You'll be the love of my life until our memories fade away. Then we'll walk through the streets and be strangers again. I don't know what made her look back at me, which is making me, makes me so curious. And the one on the right, I am just these little moments present themselves, I think sometimes. And I just love the way that the lamppost is mimicking his body language. These next two slides, I'm gonna call my lovers on a train because he's looking at her and then he moves in for the kiss. Again, I was in the carriage like behind and the window was down and I'm just being nosy, just looking through the carriage and it just happened in front of me. And you just, I think I walk around with my finger on the shutter. So um, I try to be ready. Again, another behind the window. And I just love this little boy's face. Can I ask Lucy, how often do you how often do you take pictures? Do you have certain days of the week, for example? Like is Monday your photo day or how do you usually structure your your workload? Yeah, um I mean I love weekends. Weekends is my shooting days. Um even that when I was working in, in, in the office, it would always be a weekend. Um, but even now I prefer weekends again, well, not at the moment, but um, I prefer weekends because they're busier. Um, people are not so much in a rush. I, I, I tend to go out during the week as well, but I, week, weekends for me are just busier. There's a lot more people, they're more relaxed. Um, so yeah, tend to weekends and a couple of days in the week, but I I stop everything at a weekend to go shooting. Mm. The um, just to pass this on to you um, because I know it's, it's it's been sitting here for a while. Um, um, a question uh, from um, by Nico. He asks, um, where do you think this uh, how this project will develop? So um, the I'm not completely sure if he was talking about the reflection pro projects or um, if he's talking about your general street portraiture. Uh, so maybe we can discuss it a little bit later, Nico, when we have a bit of an overview in terms of what you're going to show us, Lucy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you the story behind this shot because this again was in Sicily. Um, it was in 2000, when was it? 2018. And I actually saw this guy in London last year. Um, I was walking along by the Tate Modern and I heard this someone playing an accordion and I looked over and I was like, I know this guy. And um, I was too afraid to go over and ask him if it was him. And I really regret that now because he's definitely an unfinished story that I would love to find out a bit more about. Again, he didn't see me and then he saw me and he was quite happy for me to take his photo. And he's another one. I took him in 2018 and I went back to, he's in port, taken in Porto. And I went back to get a tattoo in 2019 in Porto. And um, I saw him and I actually went up to him and his family and showed him the photo that I'd taken and they invited me in um, to their living area. They didn't speak any English and my Portuguese is terrible. Um, but they were just, they were so excited that I was showing them his photo on my phone. Um, and I took a photo of him and his family, but it was so dark inside their living area that it didn't come out very well. This next series of photos are, um, 
all of hands because I'm fascinated by hands. Um, and I just love this, their, their own little stories that they tell with like the, the wrinkles in them and how we hold our hands behind our back. Um, and just in general, I mean, I, I think I've, I'm, last year I took a lot of hands behind people's backs because it was easier to stand behind people than get in front of them with the whole social distancing. Um, and the way we hold our hands and hold carrier bags, there's just all different kinds of ways. I just love this one. And I, I'm going to read the words. Love who you have while you have them. That's all you can do. This is one of my favourites. This is one of the only photos that I've printed out of mine. That I, um, I just love the tenderness of the moment. Um, and I'd actually walked around London for the whole weekend and I was going back to work on the Monday and I'm I decided I hadn't taken any photos all weekend, so I was really annoyed with myself. Um, finished shooting for the day, went underground, and I usually change my settings to go underground because the light's so different, but I wasn't ready on this occasion. And this moment just played out in front of me and I just quickly grabbed my camera, changed the settings really quickly. And it's not as sharp as I'd probably like it to be, but I just love the whole moment of this. Again, I love the texture in the skin in both of these people and uh, just the moment. I mean, the light on the guy's trousers and just the colours complement everything. And then the woman, I just, her jacket and her skin and her nails um, and they're just stories there. Again, on the underground. Um, just looking for a frame just to make the, the photo a bit more interesting. And the lady on the right in, in here, um, she's writing a really, a really sad, angry letter to herself. And I kind of felt like I was intruding, but the I just had to take the shot. I mean, she's talking about how she's angry with everything. Um, but again, it was just this storytelling moment that I just had to capture. And with this one, I'm really curious about why he's got elastic bands tied around his keys. So it's just these little details, I think, just you just you just got to look out for. Some people describe the uh, the, the human mind as a as a sense-making machine, yeah? So you just simply can't look at um, a bunch of keys with a with a rubber rubber band wrapped around them and not have any sorts of associations. It's just not possible. <laughs> hands, yeah? Or like old hands with perfect nail varnish. You yep. just simply have to create the story around them. You just simply can't help. It's part of our human nature. Uh -huh. And those images play with this in the most beautiful way. I've got two questions here that I would uh, would like to ask you. One is from Philip. He asks, um, do you always raise the camera to your eye or perhaps shoot from the hip? Are you using a DSLR or mirrorless with silent shutter? Okay. Um, I, use, I like to hold it up to my eye. Um, I'm not great at shooting from the hip, <laughs> to be honest. I do like raising it to my eye. I mean, not there's a few times where you just can't or you're just afraid to and you do have to kind of shoot from like down below um, but more often than not it's I raise it to my eye and I shoot now um, with a Sony a7R Mark III and again it's I prefer hearing the noise that's just me I just love the shutter um, unless I'm um, on a an underground train where I think the noise does sound like a machine gun sometimes um, so I will turn it silent or if I'm I mean just recently I've been at the bus a bus stop where there's not as much noise going around just lately because there's not as many people and if I'm afraid that it might intimidate them I will turn it to silent but I do I, I prefer hearing that noise um, I like to hear it go off mm. that answers that yeah, another one from Maria. She asks, um, where do you get your inspiration from when writing those small stories or captions? 
is it based on what you feel at first glimpse or some afterthought or after some thought? Again, it's a mixture. I mean, some of them come from what I feel at the time and I'm better, I feel like I'm better expressing myself through writing than actually speaking. So sometimes it is what I'm feeling. So there was a woman sat behind the window and I was feeling sad that day. So it was a bit of me, my emotions coming out. And then sometimes it is just sitting as I'm editing, just wondering what that person is thinking and feeling and then trying to create and use my imagination to come up with a story. So it's, it's a little bit of both. This guy I have a great affection for because I used to see him a lot and I was fascinated by his tattoos. Um, he'd always have a cigarette and be smoking and have his coffee. And um, I was actually really nervous about getting close to him. So I'm, I remember edging every, every, every minute or so, just edging closer and closer because I just had to take a photo of his hands. I, I only ever took a photo, once, one photo of his face and it wasn't even that great, just to capture his face for myself. Um, but his hands were just incredible. And I used to see him so much and then I stopped seeing him. So he's always gonna be sort of like, un, again, an unfinished story that I wish I'd spoken to, um, just to find a bit about him and his story, his life. Um, but maybe, maybe I will. But I, yeah, I just love everything about his thing, his hands, the way he sort of like, every day he would have a coffee and uh, a cigarette. Okay, okay, so these next slides are actually photos that I've taken um, just last year. Um, and I realized I had to change my approach to shooting um, purely because of what we were all going through. Um, not as many people on the streets. And if there were people, um, you know, they would see you straight away. So it wasn't easy to shoot. Um, and just also being mindful of what you know, being anxious around people, them being anxious as me and not wanting to upset anybody. So I realized that I wasn't going to be able to get as close to people as I'm, I did before um, the pandemic. Um, and I go out to, to make sense of the world around me with, by taking photos and, and help myself. So I was getting a bit upset that I wasn't able to capture these intimate moments that I was doing before. And so I invested in um, an 85 millimeter lens. I'm, I'm, I shoot mainly with a 55. Um, I, I started with a 35. Again, it's all about practice and, and mastering that one lens that you, you know, you're using. So I loved my 55, but I just knew it wasn't, it wasn't gonna be able to capture these intimate moments like last year is what I used to. So um, I bought a 50, 85 and um, again, so you're standing, a bit further away, but you're still able to be close and capture the intimacy that um, I was used to taking. So all of these next shots are taken on the 85 and I just loved how I feel like she's reflecting everything that we're feeling right now. Um, just looking quite scared and vulnerable. And these are all, um, a lot of these shots are taken in Lewisham. Um, there's some in London when we came out of lockdown, um, but most, I think most of them are taken in Lewisham. And he's in Lewisham. And as well, I'm standing behind a bus stop. So it's almost getting those window reflections, but behind the perspex of a bus stop. Again, just creating that little bit of a barrier between me and the subject to not intimidate them and not put any of, the, of us in danger um, and just being mindful. Again, she's at a bus stop and I just love the way that the light was shining down on her face and illuminating her eye. And I did go back to my one of my favourite windows in London, but I, I just and I love the stories here because of the person behind the cafe window um, and then the masked people outside. Um, and I was so pleased to see people back behind the cafe back oh, at the end of last year. And then there's the mask like behind the, behind the backstory with the hands and then the mask that we've all come to know so well. And again, I just think the colors all work here. 
And again, this one wouldn't have worked in black and white um, because of her nail varnish, her skin tone, the darkness of her coat, and then her the blue of her ring. I just thought this one was perfect in color. Again, with this 85 lens, it just allows you to be close, but being a bit further away. And I love this one in color because of just how it feels cinematic to me. And again, there's the, the, the layers of distress, like the, I'm standing behind like a, a wall or I can't remember what it was, um, but it's creating this layer and a bit of a distraction. And then you're like drawn into her face and just the colors going on. And she looks so intense. And this is the last shot in my slides. And again, you've got the masked people and the layers and then the lady standing and almost creating that frame again. And, and just making the shot a bit more interesting than if it was just of the lady on her own. You're truly the master of frame within a frame, but <laughs> not just frame within a frame. You, you know, the, the way that your, that your frame relates um, and gives dimension to the key subject is just absolutely stunning, I think. Fantastic. We've got a question from Paul, just to, <laughs> just yeah. to, just to let you know. So we constantly have questions coming in. Uh, Paul asks about um, the uh, priority mode, if you use this on your camera or if you're shooting in manual mode? Um, I shoot in manual mode mm. all the time. So you set up your, your light meter once or your exposure value once yeah. and you just keep on shooting. Yeah. Mm. I yeah. see. I've got a, I've got a question about uh, the, uh, the decisive moment. Um, because I think that the decisive moment seems to be a, an important factor in your work. It's about, you know, this hand gesture. It's about the look, the gaze the moment when people actually turn around. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? How difficult or maybe easy you find um, catching this moment? Yeah. Yeah. And what do you associate with it? Yeah, um, I mean, it is hard. <laughs> I mean, you almost, I think observing a lot, um, always looking. I mean, I never stop looking, even when I don't have my camera. Um, almost anticipating something to happen. Um, like standing here, I knew that people would be coming towards me and it's almost, you just, you're training your eye to just look out um, and just, you know, have your camera ready, um, ready to shoot when you're, I mean, here there's a road um, on the other side. So I'm almost kind of anticipating someone coming towards me um, and then just waiting as well for other people. Um, so it is, it's hard to capture that decisive moment. I mean, sometimes they present themselves um, and you've just got to be ready. And then sometimes you do, you have to, you're almost anticipating something to play out some story. I mean, street photography is just acting on the street. Um, so you've just got to look out for those little moments. Um, it's hard. It, it's, a, it's a lot of hours of just standing and walking. <laughs> How long, how long would your shooting sessions normally be? Um, in London, I think probably I'd get up, say, on a normal weekend, I'd get into town for about 10 a.m. And I might stay till six or seven. And that's oh, a that's good, good few coffees in between. <laughs> and if I'm away, if I'm not in London, where everything's new and unfamiliar and I'm so happy, um, I'd probably even get out maybe eight, seven, eight in the morning, and then walk or wander all day, and then probably go home back to my Airbnb or something, maybe again, seven or eight. Um, and just, I mean, there's a lot of rests in between there. <laughs> mm. And how do you edit your, your images? I assume if you're shooting for eight hours, you probably have accumulated I don't know, like several hundred shots, I guess. No? So the editing process, selecting just the right image must be really quite time consuming. Can you, can, can you, can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, my hard drives are full <laughs> and I never delete. I'm really bad at deleting. 
Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll just get home and I'll just um, select. Just again, it's just almost like looking through the images and just seeing, I mean, I shoot a lot of those reflection um, stories, so like for reflection images and just looking for one that really catches my eye and um, just tells more of a story. So whether they're looking up or they're just glancing at something behind the window and just getting that perfect um, reflection outside. Um, it's just, yeah, just going through them. And again, just cap finding an image that just speaks um, and tells a story like this one. I mean, this, I probably took hundreds of photos here and um, of people and maybe the, the image didn't align up so well with the woman perfectly between these two others. And it's just yeah, going through them um, and finding that one shot that just kind of speaks to me. Mm. And if I could come back to um, to Nico's question, um, as said before, it's it's um, not completely clear if he uh, he or she was referring to the uh, to the uh, the reflection project that you that you present at the beginning or more about your entire body of work when he or she asks, um, how do you think this project will develop? But what would you say? Um, is there, can you see that there is a, an organic um, evolution process going on in your work and the, um, the, 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 the progress, the statistic progress in your work is rather gr gradual or do you set yourself specific tasks um, what is what's what's in the pipeline? Mm -hmm. um, I think I mean I'll never stop taking these photos because they just make me happy. So I don't think the project or taking this kind of image is going to stop anytime soon. Um, I think maybe um, I'm, I mean I'm I love at the moment I'm documenting the people of Lewisham because it's what I can take right now. The photos I can take. So maybe that's. A little project that I've set myself to shoot and I don't know what I'll do with it um, and I, I, I try to set myself projects, especially last year where it was where shooting was a lot harder um, I mean I love taking photos of hands so I've got that's a project in itself um, that I'll probably just carry on um, and I think it is important for people to set projects for themselves like photographers because um, it keeps you motivated um, and it keeps you wanting to go out and shoot. Um, so I don't know if that helps with that question. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, just in the pipeline, um, again, it's just all, a lot of it's personal projects. <laughs> um, I mean, me and my friend are setting up a website to actually do um, occasions and weddings but in our style of intimate street documentary style photography so we did one wedding just before lockdown last year which was weird because it was at night and um tote masks and everything so that was weird that was our first wedding so but we want to do it in our intimate kind of street photography storytelling style um, so that's something that i've got sort of like in the pipeline um, and other than that I'm just I just want to keep telling stories and I, I want to go out and capture. <laughs> We've got Philip asking that links really really interestingly um, in a really interesting way to what you just said. What do you think that your photographs say about you? Oh that's an interesting one. Yeah. <laughs> From the outside perspective. Um, I mean I think I honestly think that you're a photographer's work, you can tell a lot about the person. I hope it tells that I'm compassionate, <laughs> honest, um, true, um, authentic. Um, I don't know. What would I don't know? I'd like to know what he thinks about me. <laughs> okay, that's that's actually really great. So if if anyone here is up for it, yeah, you can just really quickly write your write your favorite let's say like um <laughs> <laughs> nico just just type she's sneaky but <laughs> with a with a with a naughty naughty smiley yeah um, 
<laughs> so if all of you, if you just really quickly want to, want to, but in a nice way, of course, yeah, yeah want please. to type in like your favorite <laughs> association, that'd be great. Uh, because I still have an, another question here. So you can see, guys, I'm doing a really great job here. On the one hand side, I've got the, the chat. On the other side here, I've got the Q and A's. Yeah, trying to keep both of them, um, you know, trying to monitor both of them. And Nico in the other one asks, uh, do you tend to use burst mode like many contemporary street photographers? Um, yes, I do. Um, I do, because I think with my photography i mean if you're watching someone behind that window and they're having a conversation or they're just looking and then they look up you have to kind of be ready so i do shoot quite a lot on burst mode again that's where the whole sometimes it sounds like a machine gun going off my camera or it feels like a machine gun sometimes um so do which is where the a7r3 um kind of change things because you can do burst mode on silent um, although I do find with the A7R3 burst mode on silent, not all the shots are that sharp. So um, if I turn it off from silent mode, they're a lot sharper. Um, but then that's where the noise comes in. So yeah, I do use burst mode. Mm, okay, interesting. The We've got, um, just to give you an overview over the, the different associations here, we've got empathy, very nice. Uh, we've got, um, Philip says, um, great feeling for people and that he admires that you stick to your style very good yeah and uh, Eunice here made an, made a made a question a tea question about about photography versus ice cream um, Andrew said uh, that he thinks that your images look caring very nice and the then Philip asks about um, the your choice of camera he asks if you have ever used an uh, Fujifilm X pro camera no I haven't <laughs> I've always been Sony so apart from when I had that DSLR years and years ago like seven eight years ago um, I've always been Sony so I had a Sony a7 start with a7r then I got I um, upgraded to the a7r2 and now I have the a7r3 and it just works for me I just I like the way it feels um, I can carry it around all day um, and it, yeah it just works for me mm. Yeah, I think it's really important that you become uh, fluent, I guess, with the with the equipment you're using, mm -hmm. um, because you know ultimately, like, well, a camera is a camera, and uh, it's really important. I think that you, yeah, just as you said, the um, make the make the equipment become your your friend. And that's friend, yeah. And I think when I was choosing the A7, I I did feel the um, Fuji, but for me, the grip on the Sony was what sold it to me that I know it's, it's just it was just holding it in my hand and I think that's a big thing for when you're selecting a camera it, it, I mean of course the specifications and everything have got to do what you want and you know you want but you've also you've got to carry this camera especially if you're a street photographer you've got to carry it for maybe seven or eight hours um, and so for me having that grip on the Sony was brilliant and it felt comfy um, and I think that, you know, you've got to think about that and hold the camera maybe before you, because it's a lot of money. Um, so hold that camera or borrow it or, you know, use somebody else's um, just so that you can kind of just get used to it and, and just see how it feels in your hands. Because, I mean, my hands are quite small, but <laughs> um, I think other, you know, you've just got to feel it. You've just got to hold it. Mm, yeah and it, it also must be said that the ultimately like um taking pictures is a very you know it's a physical pleasure i think and the you know the camera you're using um you know plays a part in that the just a while ago i, I took some pictures with a with a film on me of some surface in in um in japan mm -hmm. And I had completely forgotten about this whole experience of medium format and the big camera and the manual focus and this incredible sound, yeah, it makes. And there is such a joy in taking pictures, really. I mean, the the, the cameras and as you just said, the, the satisfaction it actually gives you to hear the shutter click, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe the vibration, if there's anything like that. Yeah. Um, these are really important factors. We really have to be, have to be honest without getting too equipment crazy you know about whatever megapixels etc but the um but a, a camera is an incredibly beautiful tool and you have to like it and you have to yeah. love it 
yeah pictures, I think yeah 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 no totally yeah uh, everyone so that's the it's a it's a good occasion now to I think we are um, we are we are organically now merging this into the into the Q&A section I know you had uh, have already asked like tons of questions which is absolutely amazing um, if you have any more questions now is the time to ask those um, we've got uh, more more characterizations here from 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 the from the uh, attendees one says very nice one says uh, compassionate eye for detail light is an important element things uh, that send out in loose images very nice thank you so much yeah and then yeah philip definitely recommends to try an, an x pro camera okay. um good fantastic everyone um just in case if you don't have any further questions then um uh, amazing i mean i'm absolutely delighted to have talked to you about this uh, your images are really absolutely fantastic and uh, it was a great pleasure to have had you on the talk everyone if you have uh, joined a little bit later before or after i have uh, showed you where you can find those images let me quickly remind you again let me quickly show the share our web page so this is our web page london institute of photography lrp.co.uk and then you go to events and then talks at the bottom. And then here you can see um, those talks. It usually takes us about two to three weeks until we uh, finally make this online. We give to have to give it a quick edit, etc. And uh, then you can actually see this here. And um, yeah, so just to want to remind everyone where they can actually find the recordings. We've got one more question here. We've got from Andrew. Uh, I've seen you out shooting and you disappear. You almost become invisible to people. That's really interesting. <laughs> people don't see, uh, seem to see you when you have a camera up to your face. How do you achieve that? That is really interesting. <laughs> How do you do that? Um, it might help being quite short. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I just, I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't, I don't do anything magical. Um, I'm just me. I don't, I, I really don't know <laughs> is the answer. Um, I think a lot of it is blend. I think as um, going to somewhere busy, you blend in, you tend to blend in um, a lot easier than if you're going somewhere that's quiet. Um, so standing at a busy intersection um, or a busy market. And I think ob observing for a while, rather than going in, you know, bang, bang, bang with your camera doesn't achieve anything. Observing your surroundings, um, working out a few of the people, letting them see you and that you're no threat, I think is a big thing rather than, yeah, just pointing and shooting as soon as you get somewhere. Um, I think that's, I think that's maybe some, possibly a part of it because I think, I mean, I stand in, in, in an area in Lewisham and the people around me, I feel like they know me. Um, so if I were to go up and take their photo, they'd probably be all right because they've they've seen me standing there. Um, I haven't just gone up and pointed my camera in their face. Mm. Yeah, and I assume it probably also has a lot to do with practice that you know that you can actually be patient and that mm -hmm. you can be relaxed because I guess if you're relaxed, then people also feel you relax and you know you're going to blend in naturally i think mm -hmm. yeah uh, we've got the um uh big compliment from jillian who loves your work and has your book and yeah. also uh philip uh, asked about um uh, if you um were influenced by saul leiter if you know his work yes i do know saul leiter's work um i think his work is incredible um i'm also i think my, one of my biggest influences is vivian meyer um, I love her work. Um, I yeah, I I think she's played a huge influence in in just me looking at what's going on around me, um, and her like, her way, her approach, and she she was almost invisible and silent. Um, mm. So yeah, both of them incredible photographers. Super, good. Then thank you so much for tonight. Uh, it's been a, an incredible pleasure and uh, hope to see you again at one point in person uh, after uh, post lockdown. If you should be in central London, just say hi and we're going to 
have a coffee. Good. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for attending and for staying with us.